So, oh, thank you, Marianne, for inviting me to uh, do this presentation today. It's a and, pleasure. And uh, my, you know, my, it's my pleasure. So this is uh, welcome to this uh, week's edition of Backgammon Sunday, with twice the knowledge but only half the calories. And uh, so this is going to be uh, titled "The Man Who." didn't quite break the bank at Monte Carlo. And there's a song written in uh, 1892, which will tell you how far back my music tastes go, written by Fred Gilbert called The Man Who Broke the Bank at Monte Carlo, which was made famous in the 1962 movie, Lawrence of Arabia, where Peter O'Toole sang the song while coming out of the desert. And so we're gonna take a look at uh, 10 positions today. This first one from the first round against Andreas Groch, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, a uh, friendly German player. And uh, so he doubled me. I was leading 4 0 to uh, 17, and he doubled me here. I thought about it quite a while. I was just wondering wow, I've got, he's got a five point board, and I've got a lot out in the outfield and a lot of his numbers work for him, you know, threes and fours jump out sixes escape and he could lift with an ace or a deuce. So it seems like most of the numbers work for him except for fives. So uh, I was concerned about, uh, he did double this position. I was concerned about taking. Uh, so does anybody have an opinion on whether they think this is a take or not? Let's, I guess, see a show of hands. Peter likes the take. Peter Halbert, 2004 world champion. Um, okay, so let's just continue here. And uh, I did actually eventually take. Uh, so now we'll go to the answer. Uh, the answer is, it is slightly a no double. So it's an excellent double by Andreas. Uh, and so my reason for taking was is that he has quite a few bad numbers. You know, fives are especially bad. Double fives is horrible. Uh, five one, five one is awful. Which he actually rolled five one in the match. Uh, five two is pretty crummy. But even if he pops out, you know, with like six five, six four, six three, five four, he's leaving a direct shot. So I'm instantly like winning the game or very close to it. Uh, if he does you know, have to leave that open blot and I pick it up. Uh, so, yeah, you know, like, like I said, in the actual game, he rolled 5-1 and I didn't redouble. I don't think it was redouble, uh, as I recall. Um, but I thought this was kind of a tough problem. I mean, actually, in terms of equity, it was a pretty easy one. But, you know, it's the first time I was in Monte Carlo in four years and I've only played four times. And I wanted to do the right thing. So I did take the extra time. And that's another small lesson in uh, clock management, just, you know, make sure you take your time because I, th I think I've seen most people with the exception of Michael Niagu, uh, I call him 007 because he's constantly left with seven seconds left in the clock, but I never get him time out. So he's fantastic. And a lot of other players, Mochi as well, they'll, they'll get, they'll use their time. Uh, they'll get down to under a minute, but they manage it. So I see a lot of people with left with a lot of time at, uh, on their clock at the end of the match. And it's kind of a mistake. You, you know, even if it's an a, apparently a simple position like this one, you want to make sure you get it right. So use your time uh, to a point, but, you know, mostly. Okay, so then I was wondering, and this is what I do in examination of positions, is what would have to change for this position to become a drop? Um, so one of the first things that I uh, came up with was a, a corollary position where instead of the uh, spare checker being on the two point, it was on the four point. I mean, naturally, if it was a closed board, almost assuredly it'd be a drop. But if you just take the checker from the two to the four, I wonder how much of a difference it would make. So let's take a look at that uh, corollary position that I set up here. Uh, recent games. Back on Sunday 1A, and surprise, 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 it's a huge pass. So I don't know how many of you would have like had the inclination to, you know, determine that this was like a huge pass. 
as opposed to like barely or not even being a double. But, you know, that just shows you like seemingly small changes in position can have dramatic differences. Um, you know, in this case, well, uh, you know, if, if he rolled the same bad 5-1, at least he could maintain a five-point board, whereas in the original position, he had to bust down to a four-point board. Um, so anyway, I thought this was an interesting position, and uh, I thought maybe this was my year because as well as Andreas played, and he did play well, I won 17 nothing, And that's just incredible. And how do you win 17 nothing? you know, you know, a match, you know, it, it's just... Anyway, so that's what happened. So I go on to the second round, and I played Vincent Denardi, French fellow, and we came up to the second problem here. So, okay, so wow. So, yeah, my dice were really hot, continuing you know, from 17 nothing in the first round to 10 1 lead the second round. It's like, I thought, like, wow, I really know this game. But, you know, as we all well know, then. <laughs> That game is a tricky game, and once you think you know everything, then you don't know anything. In any case, uh, so I was leading 10-1 in this position, and I really liked the position. I mean, position, race, and threats, I got it all. I was up uh, 33 in the race. That's pretty darn good. I had, he had one checker on the bar, as well as three more checkers back, and I was shooting at him with deuces, threes, fours, sevens, eights, nines, and tens. That's a lot. I think almost everything works. I might be able to find a weak number, but uh, I'm not gonna try right now. So uh, so I doubled here. Uh, so show of hands, does anybody think this is a double? And uh, let's take a quick poll here. Scroll down on the, uh, okay. All right, so in any case, I did double here. And as it turns out, this is interesting. I didn't know this at the time, certainly. Um, okay, it's a pretty sizable no double. Uh, hmm. So the one good thing about this is, is when you're running that hot, you know, depending on the sophistication, level of sophistication of your opponent, they may just be like, feel like run over and it's like giving up, you know? And um, well, Vincent did not certainly, so he played well, but you know, there you can double a position that's a no double if, uh, you know, it's Woolsey's Law, welcome kid, I learned from you. Uh, any case, yeah, if you, well, I guess that's if you're not sure if it's a take, you should double, but that that's that's a for sure. But in any case, in this situation, I thought it was a double legitimately. Uh, and I don't tend to play that many really long matches, like 17, I usually play like 11s, sevens, nines, that kind of thing. But as, you know, so as it turns out, this is a sizable no double here. So then in further study, after the match is over, um, and after I ever put it in transcribed, I think, okay, so when would it be a double? So if it's not a double at 10-1, you know, is it a double at an even score? Well, let's see, let's control shift C, control V, let's make it for money just to make it simple. And yeah, it's, it's a pass. So I didn't make the proper translation from you know, money play or an even match score to where I was leading 10-1 and gave a pretty bad double, which Vincent took. Uh, so then the question becomes, well, at what point would it would become a double? You know, if it's not a double with a 10-1 lead, how about 9-1? How about 8-1? How about 7-1? And continuing on. So, you know, I fiddled around with it. And as it turns out, the crossover point, that's what I like to call the point at which it doesn't really matter either way, presuming perfect play from your opponent. What will be double? It turns out with a, and I can save this one, with a 7-1 lead, it's right on the edge. So I'm not sure how much you can learn from this exact position other than, uh, you know, when you get that pretty big a disparity in scores, it can turn what is a normally a pass into not even a double. So that's something, you know, you'll have to do with study on your own time, uh, citing, you know, when to double. And also, you know, keeping in mind the tendencies uh, that your opponent has regarding taking and, and passing. And when I have the time, I uh, actually scout my opponents, you know, like especially Monte Carlo. I had, we had uh, 2 p.m. matches and 
10 p.m. matches. So six hours in between. And usually the match would take like two or three hours. So you have like three hours to scout your next opponent. And so I go to Back Heyman Studio and they have matches there with, you know, all the way back from the 70s. It's a great site. And, uh, it, you know, matches from way, way back. And you can see <laughs> if, uh, if your opponent has some matches, I mean, you know, players like Kit and myself have dozens or hundreds of matches. And some of the other players, I played um, a money round match in uh, Florida recently. And the player that I uh, that I played against, I tried to look him up and he didn't have any matches there. So I guess he didn't play that many tournaments. All right, so, so this is like the break even point. So yeah, money pass, not even a double at 10-1, but a 7-1 lead, that's the borderline point. So. And this is something that you can do on your own. Uh, okay, let's get to the next position here. Problem Steve, number I think, three. Um, I think Git has a question. Oh, I'm happy to hear it, yes. Say something. Yeah. Uh, okay. Go ahead. I think the, the reason, what you want to look at this sort of position is the reason why it is not a double. And the answer is as follows. It's really not a volatile position at all. In other words, you know, you're going to hit something. He's going to probably come in with a checker. In other words, nothing is going to happen much on the next roll. Thus, assuming he has a clear take now that you have to judge, but at this score, I believe he does, <laughs> does have a clear take. But if he has a clear take, you're not going to lose your market, whatever happens. And if you're not going to well, lose your market, there's no point in doubling. It's just not a volatile position. Nothing's going to happen on the next exchange. And that's, right. the whole, so that's the whole key to the position. Yeah, Kit's absolutely right. And, and that's something I negated to, to mention in describing the position is the fact that he's got the 20 point means that you talk about Wachtell's book into the game till the end. Well, it's the 24 point. He's got, <laughs> he's got the 20 point. He's in the game until the end because... I mean, yeah, I can hit him, but he's probably going to make some kind of second anchor in the board. I, he has his five point made. So he's in a great, you know, obviously I'm a favorite here, but he's in great position to fight back, you know, either making a back game or I roll something, maybe five one and he rolls double deuces in any case. But yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I, I, I picked the wrong time to double, but you know, so we're talking about, you know, if you, some good plays and cube decisions that I made today, but also some mistakes that I made and, you know, and I help my students I have, you know, some backgammon students and they say, well, I don't want to look at these positions. It's like these blunders they are really bad. I'm embarrassed. I said, look, the bigger a mistake you make, the greater an opportunity is to learn. So, and then they feel better about it. And, 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 and I'll, and I'll show them mistakes that I make and they're think, oh, you know, you're a great player and all this, but I make, you know, mistakes. Backgammon is a difficult game. Um, so anyway, let's move on to the next position here. Number three. Okay. So, whoops, I thought I had this one set up as the problem without the answer. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, here, I'll just hide, pretend you didn't see this. Okay. So, so I have a six, four to play here and there's a lot of different ways to play it. I mean, you can run off the anchor. You can make the second, you know, the forward anchor, you can slot inside your board. You can just bring two down. So you have a lot of different choices here on how to play it. And um, does anybody uh, have an idea what they think is the best play? Like who would vote for making the forward anchor? 24, 20, 13, 7. Okay. Mark says yes. Okay. He went with my play. Jacques says yes. Um, in any case, so I made that play. And, but there's a lot of other really good plays here. I mean, you can, you're not gonna make the deuce point, but you could bring two down, you can slot the four point, you could just run out with the checker and bring a checker down. So a lot of different ideas. But as it turns out, uh, I made the 20 point. Let's take a look at the answer here. Which is three. Okay, so my play was pretty bad uh, as it turns out. Sorry, Mark, but you know, we're not perfect. Okay, so here's the play that I made. I wanted, and I thought because he stripped on all the outside points that he may have some difficulty bringing the checkers in. 
And so like if he leaves a shot, you know, a couple, two, three rolls down the road, he might do a single shot, double shot. But I think the problem with my play was that I'm just not ready to contain yet. Uh, I only have a two point board. I have the makings of possible four prime, but I'm far from that. And, but I think maybe even the bigger thing is, is just, you know, letting your opponent play, play, play past you. I mean, there aren't that many like really bad rolls. So let's just say that I did this. Oh, well, that's okay. No, well, there is, there is, a, there is a checker straggler there trying to uh, police the, you know, lower, white's lower board. But, you know, because black only has a two point board, white can attack pretty freely, you know, if they roll an inconvenient number, like six, five or something, even a great roll, like five, three, that like force them forward. And so as, you know, white is just assembling their prime, they may either elect to leave a shot if it's correct, which probably wouldn't be the case, or they may be forced to with a series of inconvenient rolls. And maybe I've made the four point by then and maybe a four prime, but it's still not necessarily enough to completely contain. So I just had the wrong idea there. The right idea is just, you know, simple, just play, uh, you know, just slot inside and you don't mind if you get pointed on there because I mean, I guess it improves your timing to a certain extent. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, they're stripped on that point, but if they, you know, let's say they roll a four, three and point on you and uh, you know, you, you're not super interested in like hitting them back right away. So white doesn't even need to be worried about too much about leaving the fly shots because either black should not want to hit or they won't elect to hit. And this ace three back game against an outside prime, it's not ideal, it's pretty good. I think the deuce three back game is the best against the outside prime, but ace three is pretty good. So I guess the main feature of this position is, is that we're just not ready to contain yet, number one. And number two, um, we don't want to like open up uh, the lower territory for attack by our opponents so that, you know, you know we're forcing ourselves into a three five game, which is not as good. And timing's not an issue. So that's the lesson from that one. And uh, anyway, so I did win this match. Um, Vincent uh, made an amazing comeback. He was down. Uh, oh, no. Who is I apologize. This is uh, it was from David Howell. And yeah, actually. So, yeah, this the second position was from Vincent Denardi. This third position, yeah, uh, let me give him credit. David, David Howell player from the United States and he took me to DMP uh, and he won the match. And as a reward for David winning the match and beating me in the third round, he got to play Wilcox Snellings in the fourth round. So, you know, back to back, what, what a couple of matches uh, for David. And he also took Wilcox to DMP. He didn't win that match, but you know, credit to David for putting up a good fight on the biggest stage. Okay, now let's take a look at. Um, I think Peter has a question. Oh, please, thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I was uh, thinking um, I would have moved uh, to 14 and to four um, because uh, I believe that, that if we just jump to 14, we'll have uh, more checkers and uh, actually have uh, more real timing than uh, if we get hit and be sent back because we can still be behind prime. And then we only have four checkers to move uh, around the board. So uh, I, I feel like that, to me, it makes much more sense uh, than just two down it's or one reason. down one. Yeah. Down. But I guess the reason it's not quite as good as just slotting, and because you, but in both plays, we're playing eight to four. So in XG's number one play, is bringing one down. And in your play, you're coming out. But I guess the additional harassment value that the checker on the 20 point adds to your game makes it uh, potentially a little bit better because you have a little bit of upside because this checker is guarding the checkers on the uh, on the 10 point, white's 10 point. Whereas if you come out, then, you know, for example, they could roll by one and make a six prime. But I see, you know, your play is considered a small mistake. It's not all that big a deal. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's in any, in any case, it was a way better idea than the one I had. So, so thank you, Peter. Okay, so let's go to the fourth one. Okay, so the problem for number four, oops, 
Okay, so so I had a uh, four three to play here, and so this is in the uh, I lost. Like I said, I lost to David, and I'm playing Antonio Scambuto, uh, who is a fine player. And this was the first second chance match that I had. So I had a four three to play. He's leading three zero to eleven. I own the cube. And so I said, okay, so let me hit with a three, hit with a four, stack it up. Uh, so who likes that play or who would actually be adventurous and slot the uh, five point or the three point? So who would, slot, who, would, who would slot either one of those points? Okay, so, all right. Let's take a look here at the answer. The answer is, Okay. So it turns out it's actually right to slot the three point. Second best is to slot the five point. My play was third best, stacking it up. Okay, so let's take a look and see how these plays look here. Yeah, so first of all, my play. Um, well, uh, I don't have, you know, another thing I tell my students is it's a lot easier to make a point when you slot than when you just like have builders to make the point. Way, 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 way easier. Then you got to ask yourself, like, well, how risky is it to slot? So in this case, I mean, Black's got two checkers behind a five prime. And, you know, it's going to be some, um, oh, we have two on the bar here. OK, so, yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's very doable to be able to win this game. But in order to give yourself the best chance, you got to try and, you know, make the point. And so the benefits that can have from making the point uh, or slotting the point. Let's take a look. So this is uh, this would be the uh, ideal play according to XG. Is that it diversifies your numbers? So your opponent's not a favorite to hit you. If they hit you, it's bad. It's really really bad. But it's a highly volatile situation. And that if uh, you get a third checker sent back, you know you're in bad shape. But if you but if you slot and they don't hit you, then I wouldn't say you necessarily have a recube. Well, you might. Uh, actually, let's check that out. So, Steve, this is Karen. You have a question in the chat from Daniel. I can't see the chat. I apologize for that. Slotting play is What's right. The if would the slotting play be right if White didn't have a blot in the board? Well, let's check that out right now. Okay, first of all, I already have this set up here. Uh, I wanted to see if, what do I have? Something about this position I didn't set up right. I apologize about that. But anyway, so um, back to the original. Oh, great. Let's go back. Two, three. Okay, the question, oh, I'm gonna go to four, sorry. Question was, if we, yeah, yeah, I, um, okay, so, okay, so now let's take, so, okay, so let's take this checker and put it back on the four point. And so now, well, let's, let me think about this a second. Okay, so do I think this, this would be better? Uh, Kit has something to say. What's that now? Uh, Kit, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think slotting is the best play regardless, but one of the reasons I believe why it's so much better under these particular circumstances is if you slot and he doesn't hit, you are going to have a super powerful redouble. Yeah, let's take a look whereas, at that here. Okay. Whereas if you play 13 to six, 13 to nine, nine to six, and he, doesn't do anything special, you're not going to have much of a threat at all. Okay, especially trailing 3 0, it's a recube. Kit's right about that. So it's almost a pass. It's a redouble. Yeah, and the way I played it, so the less ambitious play of just. No, it's, it's, it's not a redouble. Okay, so. Or... 
Yeah. So yeah, the diversification numbers that you offer yourself by like making the where's the yeah, this is a big play here. Sorry. Where, yeah, by slotting here, now you give us a good sixes to pop out, threes and fives to cover, and as Kit said, a very powerful redouble. Steve, okay. now so a good way, a a, I think an important way to see whether I'm right or not, which I'm not sure, look at the same position, but give him the cube and, and see what the difference in the place is. Well, you, you know, the, the generalization is, is that once you've given up the cube, you wanna play the, with more uh, aggression, You've already doubled, so that probably not, not, would be not a great. Not a. It's not a question of aggression. It's a question of do you. Have, I think one of the one of the big advantages for slotting is the threat of the recube. So if that threat isn't there, let's see how close the plays are. Yeah. All right, let's take a look. Here. Peter has something to say as well. Yeah, it's it's quite it's quite a bit closer when you're you see, now, now, well, now, that, now, now it's like a photo between the two plays. That's interesting. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, yeah, I believe that that definitely the the, the cube has something to do with it. But uh, the reason why uh, I would definitely slot here is that if I play the stiff move by uh, playing to the six point, uh, I will probably hit or slot one of the points uh, uh, by force uh, during the next next couple of rows anyway. I can just as well do it now, well, well when I know it's good, uh, and and yeah. also I don't care about the block. Uh, because I'm I, I'm not too happy uh, to hit it anyway, so, so I don't think that's important. So the recube, and also that I will be forced to to slot for either five or four three point games. These are all very good points, and I wish <laughs> you guys were by my side to advise me, but uh, that's not allowed. So, okay, let's go into position five here. Okay, let's see what we got here. This is okay. So that was against Antonio Scambuto. We had a very exciting match uh it was seven seven to eleven and i i missed like five cubes in a row in a holding game and then when i finally doubled them when i finally redoubled them it wasn't a double so that was interesting okay uh so I, yeah i got lucky against antonio uh and then in the next match i played thorsten hoyer from germany position five we're going to take a look at the problem here oh i got a four one okay so there's only a couple of ways to play it here you either make the eight point or slot the uh so lots of seven well i am ahead nine two obviously i'm not going to double i'm going to play for the gammon here or certainly not going to open up uh double and open up an opportunity for uh, thorsten to redouble me so but there's only really a couple of plays here so there's a slotting play and there's the point play so who wants to be ambitious to slot here for leading nine two to eleven anybody like that Jock, we haven't heard from you. What do you like? I play so the eight point. Okay, well, you're the pro and I was the amateur because I slotted. I'm going to look at the answer here. Uh, five. Okay, 138 is sizably better. It's like a mini blunder, you know, uh, 0.048. But my thought was okay, so why not just, you know, go for it? You know, it's like I've got an anchor. I have a better board. He has a blot in his board. So it seems like such a natural play. But, and it was actually an interesting one because this is my style. I like to take chances. Well, with the exception of that four or three from the previous move. But I like to take chances, you know, when I'm in a good position. So, you know, if I'm a favorite, I want to try and become more of a favorite. So it's a little bit of a mystery to me as to why this play is... Uh, not quite as good because it seems like all the elements for like taking the risk are there. And even if you get hit, it's not that big a deal, but this is just super interesting. Let's plus plus it. I don't think it's gonna make that big a difference, but so, so uh, Kit or Peter or anybody else have an idea as to yeah, why yeah. slotting is wrong here? Yeah, I thought I actually did think the plays were close, but I liked 13 to 8, so it turned out I was on target. But I think the reason it's wrong is that you don't need the bar point to win. You just need to basically you don't need it, bring but you the sure position like home. Oh, of course you'd yeah. like it, but you don't need it. Whereas if you slot it and it gets hit, you suddenly lost a lot of your advantage. 
So that I yeah, think I, just, I think that's the reason. I I mean I thought I thought the plays were close, frankly. So I wouldn't worry about getting it this wrong. Yeah. No, I mean I I just thought like everything was there. I got a better board. I have an anchor. He's got a blot on his board. I mean, it's like everything is there to like take the risk, but it was wrong. So I think this is worthy of like further consideration, further study uh, to really sort of figure out like actually why it was wrong. Maybe at a different score, it might not be. I mean, let's try something. Let's. But, but actually, I, I agree with Kit here because uh, you don't want the volatility. I mean, you already basically want the position. You have a superior position and the volatility uh, hugely uh, favors uh, wide in the position. And especially, I mean, if he can get lucky, if he can hit you on the set point. Uh, so if you just don't let him, then he doesn't have any jobs. Just have a superior position, in, in my mind. And you need two points, right? Or, oh, oh I read the four wrong. Yeah, I reversed the you, score You're here. behind two, uh, two nine. Oh, sorry. Did, did it change? Hmm. No, yeah, I, I was just fiddling with the score just to make it. I mean, let's just say, yeah. All right. All right, so I appreciate your guys' input on that one. So oh, running... oh, I, I take my input back. I, I misread the score. I, I thought it was the other way. No, it was. It was. I just, I, you, I was in the original position. I was leading 9 2 to 11 with Cuban. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Then I stand by, by my comment. Yeah, you're not seeing <laughs> an apparition here. Okay, let's go to problem number six here. Thank you. Well, Steve, I mean, looking at the, the cube the other way doesn't make any sense because it wouldn't be that way you would have you would have doubled no that's true so it's, that it's irrelevant true. irrelevant okay so now this next uh, position here this is against uh, simon barger who though he had a very very interesting match in uh 2017 or 18 i forgot which year chris trencher and i played in the finals of the uh Malcolm Davis, Texas Longhorn Classic. And there were no, there were no doubles that were taken in the first 12 games of the match. I forgot what the score was. It might've been tied or somebody was ahead by one or two, but there were no, so you would figure there were a bunch of missed doubles and there were, and, uh, but then I topped that in this one, Simon and I played the first 16 games of an 11 point match. There was no doubles that were taken. We had 16 consecutive one point games which seems quite amazing because you not only, somebody didn't even win an undoubled gamut or they didn't never double when it was a take. So a lot of conservative cube action. And I told Simon at the time, you know, after the match, I said, I think I missed a bunch of doubles and I was right looking at the match. Uh, we both still played well, but yeah, I missed a bunch of cubes. Uh, so in any case, here's, uh, here's one of those situations where either missed, he missed a cube or I dropped incorrectly. And so the score was 2 2, 2 11. Simon's playing the white checkers. He's on roll. He doubled me. And so I had a decision to make. So, anybody want to pipe in whether they would uh, think it's a take or a pass? I mean, he has, he has an equal board, but he's got a better prime. He has an anchor, which I don't have an anchor. He's got fully diversified numbers threes, fours, and fives to attack. Six is to jump out. You know, even a number like three, two can make the eight points. So he's got a lot going for him. But I do have a four prime, although there aren't, you know, many active builders lined up on top of the prime to stop his attempted escape if he does pop out with five or a six, especially a six. So who likes to take here? Who likes to drop? I would drop a close trivial double just by Wolsey's rule, if nothing else. Yep. Okay. And turns out this was a this was a relatively close one here. It actually was uh, pretty pretty darn close. Uh, I didn't roll it out yet, but you know, plus plus is 0.976. So no big deal. But in any in, in any case, it's a good reference position. So, you know especially because it's a pretty simple one. The scores are equal um, and it's right, ar right around the take pass, you know, point. So, you know, so this is one you can remember for the future. It's like, okay, four prime versus four prime, you know, two back versus two back. Uh, I got one on the bar, which is obviously my disadvantage. He's got, you know, diversified attackers and escaping numbers. So I, I did drop it, you know, kids says drop, but, uh, Double, trivial, trivial double. 
But in any case, uh, so this is one of the 16 consecutive one point games that we had. Uh, it's, it's a good, it's a good solid reference position. I mean, you can change a few elements of this position here. Obviously, if I add it in an active builder to my six point, it's going to be from small take to a pretty obvious take. You know, it's like you save a tenth of a point. Um, but if we put, let's say we take one of our active vultures away, give ourselves six more pips, now it's going to turn it into a drop because we lose an attacker. Um, oh, so there's something about this position I don't understand. But since we're on a time budget, I got four more positions to go over. We'll save that for another day. Thank you for your patience. Okay, number seven coming up also against Simon. Okay, so now instead of it being 2 2, it's a little later in the match, four, three, a few games later. Okay, so here's a good one here. Um, so uh, Simon's, you know, playing the white checkers. He's on roll. He's got an advanced anchor. He's got deuces and threes to make a six prime, fives to jump out. You know, some numbers like double six will attack, you know, doesn't get out. So it seems like a pretty good position for him. So the double seems re very reasonable. I am also ahead in the match. Uh, so anytime you get to less than eight away, eight away, you know, you can sort of treat it as money. But um, in this case, you know, when he gives me the cube, if I do decide to take it, then I have less of a impactful redouble because the score, you know, you know, if I redouble and gammon him, then I only earn seven of the eight points. And so it's a little less efficient. So does anybody want to just, you know, decide on whether this is a um, take or a pass? Who thinks this, who thinks it's a take? You know what I always say, if it's not a take, it's a mistake. In any case, all right, I thought it was fun. Okay, so uh, let's go to the answer here, number seven, problem number seven. So it turns out that it is also another close, nice close reference position here. And uh, should have taken the time to roll it out, but I didn't. But for the moment, you know, it's like 0.96, good double. I actually decided to drop here, of course. I've already told you it's 16 one-point games to get to a 9-7 lead for me. Um, but I just looked at the diversification of numbers. I am ahead in the race, which isn't bad. I mean, I can, you know, if I don't get blocked in, but even if, if he blocks me, if he rolls like a 4-2, then he might roll like a 6-4 in his next shake and uh or six two and then he has to bust his prime so you still i mean the, the the scary part for me was having the blood on my deuce point i mean i certainly had the scariest part was for him to cover with a three or two i did not like that idea of being blocked behind a six prime and then hoping to get lucky from there but i also didn't like having a blood on a deuce point you know if you put this checker back on the five point let's do that for fun see what that's like but that's going to be this I, i'm presuming i would have taken it uh, see, see, see if it's even a double. So yeah, you go from, oh, what did I do? Sorry, I took some, uh, let's take a look again. Okay, so yeah, so this is like comfortable double, but a very, very easy take. I'm pretty sure I would have taken this one. So like I said, the two elements of this position that really bothered me were getting six primed and also the blot I had on my deuce point. But, you know, I guess you can, you know, you can look at it from the perspective of like he has, he still has work to do. Even if he makes a six prime, he's got to get out of your board. You have counter prime ability of all your, all your pieces in play, except for the a lot of the deuce point. So but that was a close one, a good reference position. And so let's see, I got one more position from Simon match, number eight. Let's take a look at that. Good. Oh, yeah, this is a good one here. Okay, four, three. All right, so let's hear from somebody new. I um, wonder how uh, you would play four or three here. So you're leading uh, five, seven, five, playing to 11, keeps in the middle. So you're four away, your opponent's six away. You know, and I, in, in my article, can you hit I mean, uh, back him as easy as one, two, three? I advocate hitting, ma making points, and uh, escaping. And if you could do more than one of those things in the same play, it's usually better. So wouldn't that be the case where you can hit uh, 11, 7, 6, 3, maybe? Or is there another play available? Let me call on somebody here. Karen, what do you think? How do you play 4, 3 here? You know me, I'm always aggressive. So 
checking the match score. Huh? But I would typically hit and do make six three. Okay, we should play doubles sometime because we think alike. Yep. The only problem is in this case, unfortunately, we're both wrong. I apologize for that. But let's take a look at the answer. And so the answer is it's actually decisively right to play from 18 to the 11 point. Okay, but in the article that I wrote, back in it is as easy as one, two, three. I say, if you can't do something constructive, don't do something destructive. So you have a chase, choice here of escaping one checker to the uh, 11 point. So you have like, you've created one positive asset in escaping, but you haven't created any negative assets. Whereas if you play this move here, hitting covering, yes, you've accomplished two positive assets. You've hit and you've made a new point, but you did something destructive in that you've broken a blocking point and left a couple of blocks available and probably a third of the numbers hit back. And the cube's in the middle and he's trailing in the match. so. You know, any, you know, inclination to double would probably, you know, he'd probably want to do it. Uh, so it's against Simon. Okay, so, yeah, so that's the interesting point there is that you have to weigh the positive and the negative, you know, factors here. So, so in this play, the play that I made, Karen also agreed with, um, you're doing a couple of positive things, you're hitting and you're making a point, but yeah, you're leaving a little bit of negative liability. And even if they don't come in right away, you still have to reassemble your position while simultaneously trying to escape your back checker. So that's kind of a, you know, like just the guy spinning the plates on the stage and trying to keep them all spinning without uh, without falling down. Okay, so we have three more positions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one thing about this position, first of all, you're way ahead in the race. I am. So that's accurate. Hitting... So hitting doesn't gain that much. In other words, your basic plan is just to bring them around and win. And 18 to 11 does quite a bit constructively. It gets one of your back checkers home safely to where it is a builder or a spare checker, which can play later on to handle your bad numbers. So the, the real issue is, you know, what's your game plan here? And your game plan is bring them around and win. Yep. So that, that's really Good advice, kid. On. If you weren't that far ahead in the race, then hitting would be, and covering would be clear. Very good feedback, Bob, from all participants, Kit and others included. So we're going to move on to time considerations position number nine. And now I'm facing, I did get lucky and beat Simon. So after 16 consecutive one point games, I was leading 9 7. Simon doubled me correctly. Uh, he was 4 away, I was 2 away. I took, finally made the right decision. And I got lucky and won the game. And that put me in the money. Uh, but, you know, every match after that was critical. And so now I'm playing um, Johan Moazet from Sweden. And uh, he and I played one time previously in 2018, first round, actually. And uh, I did win that match, but uh, Johan outplayed me, played really well, played like low threes. So he's a great player. Um, so anyway, we got a rematch here, you know, Rocky two. Johan's going to try and knock me out, and he actually ended up doing that, knocking out. But let's take a look at problem number nine here. Okay, so, oh, okay, so, so Simon, and I'm sorry, now we're at Johan. Johan um, is five away, I'm seven away, and he doubles me. So I decide whether to take or pass. Um, and uh, I eventually drop, like, you know, chicken that I am. But um, so I don't like the position because, you know, he's way, way, way ahead of the race. Uh, the position race and threats. Well, the only liability that I can see for Johan is the blot on his ace point. But even that isn't all super terrible because he's blocked on sixes and fives with his back checker. Sixes and fives could cover. He's got deuces to hit, threes to move forward. You know, double fours makes a six prime. So most of his numbers play reasonably well. Let's go to dice distribution and see, you know, I mean like six, five, yeah, six, five and five, four. Those are kind of like the worst numbers. But you can see there's a lot of pretty nice numbers here. So certainly a double, uh, but I just didn't like it. I thought, ah, oh, you know, I'm going to get gammoned a lot, you know, so I ended up dropping. So let's go to 
number nine, answer number nine. This is the actual cube here. It's maybe it rolled out a little bit higher, but uh, so, but this is like a solid take here. And part of the reason is like obvious, as Kit would probably say, well, you're trailing in the match. Look how powerful a recube you might have if things don't go perfectly for him, you know? So, and I can sort of semi kill his gammons because he's leading five away. If I redouble him and he ends up winning a gammon, he only gets one point value for his gammon. So I can give pretty, you know, exciting redoubles that, you know, when I'm kind of on the ropes, that maybe I get lucky when a gammon and win the match. No, actually, four. Yeah, that would win me the match. So he should be a little bit tentative in sending the cube. This is a double. As we can see, it's a double. He's got to be a little bit careful because I powerful redouble. So big part of the reason why, you know, this is a take. Got a, I got a four prime. You know, I mean, if he hits a deuce, that's great for him, but I've got a shot back most likely. Take so a look at, Take a look at it at an even score. Okay, so I actually have a couple of corollary scores. I'll do that. I'll, I'll just, let me just see. Let's just do it like first game or money. Let's just be quick here. Yeah, so this is a much stronger. So, so I guess the main point is, is that I didn't properly uh, adjust for the score based on the fact that I can kill his gammons, I can redouble and win a double, uh, redoubled gammon for the match. But at an even score, it's a pretty darn strong double, and I might even roll out to a pass. Uh, so I made a couple of corollary scores here, 9A and 9B. Let's find them. Where is 9? 9A and 9B. So one of the main reasons why this is a take, we'll take a look at it at, uh, it's a little bit stronger. At seven four, but I got to be very concerned about this one. I did roll out. I got to be very concerned about him doubling me at four away when he's got gammon opportunities. It turns out it was not a drop. You know, so I, I actually gave him an extra point, and it made it a stronger double because he came four away. So that's one of the big reasons why my pass was so bad because he's at an even score. I want to keep him at an even score. So let him let him double me. He doesn't gamble me, he goes to eight. He's still three away, but I just don't want to get him to the launching pad of, you know, where he's four away and all of a sudden now double gammon, you know, wins him the match. So that's, I actually have more incentive to take even, you know, trade, you know, trailing in the match as opposed to, you know, you would think he might be, should be more careful, but he's leading more in the match, but he's not. You know, this is a very common situation, four away, four away, four away, five away, four away, six away, you know, you double, you know, and if you double and win a gammon, you can win the whole match. So that's the big, biggest probably reason why passing when I had, he had six, lets him get to seven, lets him get to the launching pad. Okay, so let's look at the other corollary position here. So 9B. Okay, now we're going to put it to a position, and obviously there's many, many different you know, adjustments that you can make to see. But now it's a huge pass here. So now when he's at, I'm still six away. I mean, I'm six away now, he's four away. But you might think like, oh, but he's got a lead in the match. He's got to be careful. But no, this overrides. The fact that he's got a gammonish position and four away overrides the fact of that he's, how concerned he should be, you know, to double me. This is actually a drop, huge drop. And I'm pretty sure I would have dropped that I dropped the original one. <laughs> it was like 0.8 something. Uh, but yeah, so he's, when he's four away, you know, four away, yeah, and four away, yeah, four away. So he's four away and I'm six away, but if he was four away and I was five away, like seven, six, or even four away, four away, four away, four was a huge drop. It's like 1.3 something. Okay. We've got about 10 minutes left. We're going to finish our last position. Uh, it is, let's see, open it up here. 10, 10A, and 10B. Oh, so we've got like four different positions to look at, but all stemming from the original one. This is the problem here. Oh, this is a good one here. Got a check and play decision here. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I dropped to let, oh, no, yeah, sorry, I dropped to let him get to, oh, no, that was a couple of games later. Okay. So he's ahead 8 6. And uh, so he's three away, I'm five. I got a double threes to play. Uh, anybody have like a strong opinion on? Uh, 
So who have I not heard from yet? Okay. Uh, Raymond. Oh, Raymond's on the phone. Let's, uh, Larry Schiller, voice of backhand, who's been silent this afternoon. You there? Hi, Steve. Great. Hey, great Larry, to have you enjoying your again. commentary and comments. From oh, kids, well, it's Karen. my pleasure. I love uh, showing Pete everybody how many mistakes I make. Yeah. And maybe I'm absolutely maybe I can... clueless on this position. Obviously, you want to make your five point. Uh, yes, I you agree. can make the bar. And make four point prime, or you could bring two men up and make the 10 point. Those seem like the choices. Those and, are the two uh, choices. Which is the right one under this in this match score, and for what reason? Uh, great. Well, so you're behind. So having the extra point in your home board, making the three point, having a three point board seems pretty solid. Uh, so you can have greater gamut chances. So I would say I go for that. Okay. So you're saying uh, eight to five, six to three, twice, and 13 10? Yes. Okay, so let's let's take a look at the answer here. I could okay, consider so gonna... twenty four to twenty one instead of thirteen to ten. By the way. Yeah. Well, I think knowledge that I consider that I think that's what I did. Um. Anyway, so yeah, so it actually is right to make the prime here. Probably in a big part because you're down in the match. You're down in the match. You want to create primes. You want to create blitzes. And there isn't that much pressure as far as you making a forward anchor on the next roll. He's got very few attacking numbers that he can use to look, you know, yeah, obviously double threes, five, three, double five, you know, but you know, even a lot like three, one or four, two, he, you know, he can make a new point, but he's got to leave a blot. So you're pretty safe from being attacked on this point here. And you'd like to, uh, you'd like to make a strong position so you can set yourself for possible double here. So if you double and you want, and, and you got a good position, you got to gammon him, Going up ten, you know, ten eight Crawford. You know, that's a that's a long shot, but if it's possible, and then you'd be in really really good shape. So because we're down in the match score, we want to make play for a more aggressive attacking and priming position. Let's take a look at a different score here. Okay, so okay, so ten. We looked at ten. Now ten a. That's the uh, so it's a corollary position here. So now we change the score here. Let's take a look here. Okay, so now I had us ahead three away, five away, instead of down five away, three away. So let's see, um, how would that impact our decision? Um, so anybody wanna offer opinion here? Marianne, how about you? Been silent. Uh, yes, I think there's uh, Meet who wants to say something, but uh, who wants to say something? It, he's standing in the chat box. So um, if he would go ahead and just say something. Yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just not observing the chat. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, all right. So we're running pretty short on time. So let me just get to the answer here. And the answer is, survey says, Richard Dawson would say, now it's pretty, pretty close. Now, either making the prime is fine, but also making the advanced anchor. I think this is a play that I actually did. But, you know, so my thinking was not quite correct because I was five away, my opponent's three away. I need to go for attacking position as opposed to like a holding position, which could develop into attacking position. But you know, I negated to do the bar point, which is very difficult to do. If I want to make the bar point now, I always say, you know, it's one other lesson that I give people, do the harder thing first. So making an advanced anchor is not going to be that difficult from the starting position here, because they're stripped in the seven and the eight. You can split, you can step up and all that. You can make an advanced anchor later. But to make the bar point, very, very difficult thing to do. Let's just say you, you do the play, this play, how are you going to make the bar point? And it's like, there are very few numbers, like, you get lucky and roll double three, double six, and all that, or you can roll three one, but that has its own liabilities. You know, six one you can't really use. So do the harder thing first. That's that's a good uh, adage to go by. Um, so because so now it's like, and, and this gets to what I call is the crossover point, where you know it's neither right nor wrong to do either play. So there's a lot of different variables that you need to consider when making a decision. But if you you know in in further study after the match is over. 
If you can determine what that crossover point is, then you have a good idea going forward by changing any one of the variables, based be on score, you know, active builder here or there, you know, which way you could play, whether it be more aggressive or more conservative. And the final position we'll look at is, uh, which actually makes the defensive play, I think I made it four-way, four two-way or two-way, four-way, let's take a look here. Open, this is the last position here. Okay, 10B, the very last position. We did really well as far as timing the lecture. Okay, so now, yeah, now I set it up for two-way, four-way. So, yeah, so black being, black being two-way, white being four-way, now you're gonna make the advanced anchor. And it's not like, it's not even like by a huge amount, but it's by enough that it seems reasonable. Um, so now, yeah, you don't want, you know, your opponent to get too many opportunities from four away. This is really nice position to have. You got your own five point made, you got the 21 point anchor. You're gonna be able to take forever. You know, even if you roll six, four and escapes and it'll, you know, you're just hanging up there, hanging in there. It doesn't even matter the race. You're not gonna get gammon. So it's a really good play to make from four away. Um, as far as, you know, the other play, it is a terrible, but you know, you're, you know, you're, you're two away, your opponent's four away, you gotta be a little bit on the conservative side. Uh, we didn't quite, quite cover as much as we possibly could have in this session, but I think we had, you know, a lot of positions to take a look at, pretty interesting and great feedback from the audience. Appreciate that. So I wanna uh, thank Marianne for inviting me to uh, have this uh, session with everybody today. Hope you learned uh, something from it. Uh, just one request. The next time you play me, don't use this against me, whatever you learned. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank Thanks, you, Steve. everyone. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Steve. It was particularly interesting to see this last analysis on how the match score uh, so strongly affects the right play. So thank you for all of that. My pleasure, Karen. And I want to uh, thank Karen as well for uh, also organizing uh, this um, meet. And I hope to see you everyone uh, next month on our Bagaman Sunday again. Thank you, Steve. All right, everybody. Thank you.